Oh, welcome back. In this lecture, we're going to look at post-processing your results with the program called GlobeK, or the suite of programs. So, so far, you've seen how to go from raw Rhinex data files to processing individual days of data in different networks, maybe different constellations. And so now we'll look at how you go about combining all of those things together. So this talk, we're going to have a quick review. We'll look at a little bit about how the Globe K system works, the flow of programs that you need to use. We'll have a very brief introduction to Kalman filtering because that is the fundamental way that Globe K does its processing. And then we'll look at the files that Globe K needs and some rules about how it decides what you want to do. And then some other ancillary programs, such as the one called Geolog, which is the one which basically defines the origin and orientation of your system, and plus it can do other things as well. And then we'll look at the different output options that you have and how things flow as you go through. An important thing to keep in mind when looking at how Globe K works is that there's often multiple ways to essentially do the same thing. And sometimes it's a good test of your own understanding to see whether you can think of different ways of doing things and then try them and see if they behave the way that you think they should. All of the Globe K programs have extensive help, uh, which is printed if no arguments are given typically. And you can also look in the help directory, which is part of your installation, and that's where all the files are contained. And so if you don't want to just look at it on the screen, you can open those files with an editor and do searching to find different things that you may be looking for. So GlobeK itself is actually a suite of programs and they're designed to combine geodetic results together. And part of the motivation for doing this is that the phase processing can take a considerable length of time. Typically, if you are processing 50 stations in a standard just GPS mode for 24 hours, that is going to take two to three hours on a reasonably fast computer to do each day of data. And when you have many years of data to process and maybe many, many stations, say a thousand stations, that can take considerable time. The idea of Globe K is to essentially eliminate many of the parameters that are local to each of those solutions and then combine them together and be able to have tools that let you look at various ways of parameterizing that data, potentially also different ways of looking at the reference frames of those data to give you the best results that you can. So GlobeK uses as its input, what sometimes we refer to as quasi-observation files. The name we call is binary H files. And the, these files basically contain geodetic solutions, which if they come out of GlobeK, or out of gamut, sorry, they are loosely constrained. And normally, if you did baseline processing, they contain just station coordinates and atmospheric delays. If you did orbit processing, what we call relax mode, it will also contain the orbits estimates that go with your solution. For most applications of Globe K, uh, we recommend that just the baseline mode be used because the orbits are extremely well known these days, and there's no real benefit unless you fully understand how to do orbit determination of actually estimating the orbits directly. You can also get results from Sinex files. This is an international exchange format. So many different analysis programs generate results in Sinex files, and those can be converted into these binary H file formats. Some of the bookkeeping information that we have with the gamut solutions is not carried through, for example, the details of the models used in the processing. However, for most things, these are quite useful to use, and we recommend them for looking at other people's results and even for looking at some of the MIT results. So GlobeK itself is what is referred to as a smoothing Kalman filter. Um, the process noise we use is a random walk process noise in its estimation. And this allows us to account for temporally correlated noise in time series, and in theory to be able to smooth time series to be able to see smaller scale patterns in those time series as we go through. There's sort of two main ways that GlobeK gets used. The first is to combine, say, many years of data together to generate a velocity field estimate. 
This is what you did in the test example case that was given to test your installation. The sequence of commands you used in there and in the shell scripts went all the way through to generating velocity fields with globe K and then plotting those velocity fields. When you get a chance, you should go back now and look very carefully at all the steps that happened in there because those are the fundamental steps that you will be doing when you do your own processing. We can also use GlobeK to do time series analysis. And the idea here again is that as your data set evolves and as your understanding of how things are moving tectonically and the things you want to focus on, it's very useful to be able to take your results and generate the time series of how they vary, to look at the statistics, to look at for anomalous values for outliers, etc. And of course, if you're doing GNSS processing, then we use GlobeK to merge the results that come from the GPS only, Galileo only, GLONASS only processing. And later on in this course over the week, we will give you some examples of how that sort of looks. So as I said, the com common applications of GlobeK, we often refer to the first one as repeatability analysis. There's a program called GeoRed that is typically used to do this. This is GlobeK Reduce, is where the name comes from. And it will process individual sessions of data, or you can use it to combine regional global files for orbit control and reference frame, et cetera. You can also combine results for uh, positions over a survey so that if you did a one week survey, many, many stations, you can put all of the week's data together into a single binary H file, and that will be used for later processing as you go on. Some people will generate monthly combinations of um, data to have a much smaller data set when they're combining many years of data together. So those steps can all be done with GeoRed, and uh, you can, as I said, also combine GNSS solutions together as you go through. And the idea is to reduce the number of H files that are being used for when you create velocity fields. So you, and you again use those combined the, uh, files to estimate velocity fields, and you can also get estimates of earthquake offsets and seismic motions from Globe K as well. One caveat to keep in mind is that particularly when you're running programs like GeoRed, if you're working in a single directory, and you're in, running in parallel with GlobeK, you do need to be a little careful of some of the internal files that GlobeK uses and to make sure that they do not uh, conflict in their names and get overwritten during the growth processing. We talk about this a little bit later and it has to do with using wildcards in your file names so that each of the files, it has a unique name when it's run from different data sets as you go through. So the basic processing stages uh, a program called h global that's what generates the binary H files. And then GlobeK itself has distinct modules inside of it that work together to form the whole solution. The first part is an initialization, and essentially all of the binary files, H files are read to determine what type of solution you have. What are the parameters that are available in the state vector for your Kalman filter? It also takes into account all of the different site names that you may have because, again, when we have discontinuities in time series, we introduce that as a change in the name of the station to have it treated as a completely separate station as we go through. And when we have earthquakes, the same types of things happen. So the initialization essentially builds up the complete set of things which you are able to estimate. And then the solution parameters that you've asked to be estimated are determined and the Kalman filter starts running. When it starts running, it runs a forward Kalman filter. Uh, the binary H files are combined to generate that solution. Um, most, again, the inputs for this are typically loosely constrained solutions. So as the forward filter runs forward, it tells you statistics of how the run is going and also will tr try to do editing on your data if there seems to be anomalous H files in there. There's a possibility that you can also run the back uh, with smoothing filter. Um, that's not that common for if you're estimating a velocity field, for example, you know the velocity field at the end of the forward run. You don't need to uh, determine that velocity going backwards. It remains constant going back. 
It's what we call a deterministic parameter typically. You can have a simple output in a program just called glout um, that generates a print file. And then there's the more elaborate output program called glorg, which does manipulations on your solution to help you realize your reference frame coordinates and also to comply, apply post-solution constraints. These typically fall in the category of when you're estimating positions and velocities, that if you've had an antenna change, which we talked about in the first lecture, there's a discontinuity in your position, but the velocity is not expected to be different. And so you want to be able to make the velocities before and after that antenna change the same. That can be done in a post-processing mode, and that's what's done in GLOR. You can also save the binary output file from your processing, and that is invoked using an out global command in the command file, and there's a program called glsave that does this. So most of the programs in here, glsave, glout, glorg, they're actually individual programs that also act like subroutines inside of the main GLORG-K program. And you can run these separately, provided you've saved some of the internal files as GLORG-K runs. So again, so if you're using non-gamut on files to convert to H to global, there is some things you have to keep in mind. So H to global does this conversion, and what the H files basically contain is the solution and its full variance covariance matrix. So when you're using SINEX files from other groups, you need to be a little careful because they can contain constraints. And if you were to use, for example, the gauge PBO frame resolve SINEX files that come from the large 2000 station network that runs across the um, network of the Americas, those SINEX files have the reference frame resolved in them. And so if you want a loose reference frame when you're using those, you want to turn on the minus D equals R option, and that will allow those those files to be able to easily rotate uh, to make a new reference frame orientation later on. If you wish to, you can also loosen the translation on the frame. And as we'll see when we talk about loading, that that sometimes is a useful thing to do. Although it's again, one of those interesting subtleties where we're not quite certain whether estimating translation explicitly is the right thing to do. It's not clear at all in the results we get. There are options in here for when you have very large files that'll let you set the memory size. A like GLOBK itself is dynamically allocates memory while it runs. Programs like h global when they start, don't really know how much memory they need because they haven't read the files yet. So there is actually a manual way you set the amount of memory that defaults to something fairly large. But when you're using the large PBO files, for example, you do need to make the memory more than the default value as you go through. If you use the IGS SINEX files, there's actually a minus S option that allows you to translate the names of the sites in there into sort of globe K type of names as you go across. And again, the minus D equals R uh, option to allow rotation should be used. We'll see later on when you're using even gamut solutions, there is a benefit to using the MIT SINEX files. And so if you were to use those, they're available from the CDDIS, then you'd want to use this minus D equals R option to allow those SINEX files to rotate. For some other groups, and one of the big ones is the Code Analysis Center from Europe, the scaling in their variance covariance matrices is such that you really need to be able to put a very large scaling factor on there. Uh, for code, actually, it's a very small scaling factor. You multiply it by 10 to the minus 4. But for other groups, you'll find that the way they do their error setting in their processing is that the variance covariance matrix can be very optimistic or very pessimistic in its size as you go through. And that's one of the things you need to work out when you're actually combining the results from different groups. So again, the basic flow of GLOBE-K and how it works in h to global does the translation. So when we run GLOBE-K, we typically give it a list of things to process. We need to give it a command file. We typically give it some sort of information about the a priori coordinates of the sites that we're processing. And typically we need to tell it something about offsets and discontinuities in the data. 
And for the standard global processing, the IGB 2014 solution is the one that is the most, that is used right now. And that's the one we distribute along with several others in the standard distribution tables. So GlobeK will produce an output which is called the print file, uh, which may be it's optionally optional. Uh, it also has a log file which gets generated that you can um, look at to see how things are progressing as you run through. And then there are binary files that save the information about the solution and those can be used then to run GeoLog afterwards. So GeoLog can be invoked directly from inside of GlobeK and that's normally the way that we do it. But if it's run as an external file, then it might use that combined common file that came from the GlobeK run and then it has its own command file. And again, it might use a different uh, APR file. And then also it has a list of um, sites that are going to be used to define its reference frame. So all of the files in GlobeK can be chosen arbitrarily. We tend to have some conventions as to what we think is the you know, logical uh, names for those uh, files, for example, .prt as an extent for the print file. We typically call the command files .cmd, et cetera. But you can call them anything you want um, as you go through. So the GlobeK command files, this basically instructs GlobeK what to do. Now there's a common rule that we use in most of the GlobeK software, which is when it's reading files, that for a line to be interpreted, it needs to start with at least one blank character. So this allows us a very easy way to comment files just by putting a non-blank character in the first column, then you can comment as you wish. And typically GlobeK is not particularly um, stringent on the formats. It's almost everything is read under free formats. So you can be very flexible in the way that you actually construct the internal file. And then you can easily comment out things back and forth as you go through. There is one case where, or a couple of cases, but the most common case in the command file, we have options that you can specify. And those do start in column one as we go through. So the types of commands that you put in the command file, there are what we call estimation commands. They tell GlobeK what you want to estimate. And you do it by telling it essentially the uncertainties in the a priori values you have for those parameters. These commands all have the form of APR underscore and then a string that sets what it is. NE up is northeast up for a station. SVS is a satellite vehicle information. WOB is wobble, for example. So this tells GlobeK that you think there's an a priori uncertainty in that parameter and that will tell it to estimate it. You can also specify information about the process noise on that, which again is a random walk. We'll talk a little bit more about this when we do common filtering in a second, but this allows you to tell GlobeK whether this parameter can actually vary with time or not, or whether it's what we call a deterministic parameter with no process noise associated with it. So they're the estimation commands. There are also a priori information commands, things which tell GlobeK about what the coordinates and velocities of sites are, a priori, where we think there's just continuities, where we want to select certain sites to be used, and et cetera. And then finally, there are commands that control the outputs, the types of files you want to output, and then what information you want written into those files as you go through. For example, here is something which will tell GlobeK to actually run GeoLog internally. GeoLog is a post-processing program, post-post processing. Um, it also has its own command file. Again, follows the same rules in the way it is constructed. And again, we'll go into details of what those are. And for many of these command files, just looking at the examples we give is a good way to get a sense of how you use them. GlobeK command files can be very simple. The simplest one you can have is just a single line which says APR northeast up all, as the name implies, it's all stations. And then it's 10 meters, 10 meters, 10 meters for the positions in north, east, and up. And then 0, 0, 0 for the velocity. And the 0 here tells GlobeK that you don't want to estimate the velocity of that site. You just want to get a position estimate uh, for it. And it will do that. And if you read Sinex files in from the IGS, for example, 
this is actually a simple way just to see what's inside of those Sinex files in terms of position information. Now there's more examples in here and the ones we recommend you look at is in ggtables, globek.command and glorg.command. These are our sort of template command files that most people use. And this is what you actually used in your uh, example processing as well. So the name, file name conventions in Globek are, um, again, they're flexible. We typically have the binary H files from H to global. When you run them from the gamut H files, they automatically generate file names, which is GLX, which is the bias-free loose solution. GLR is the bi sorry, bias fixed loose solution. Uh, this is the one we normally use. And then the GLR, which is the bias free ones. When we process CloneNAS data, because of the interfrequency biases in that system, we don't use the bias fixed solutions uh, for CloneNAS. And so you will use the GLR files for CloneNAS. For things which come from Sinex files, those get automatically generated with a .gls extent just to differentiate between them. The list of the binary H files that you want to process, we typically call a .gdl file. And then the globek command files themselves are typically .cmd. We often put a string in here, which is the type. Uh, sometimes it's very convenient to have something like an rep for a repeatability command file. And then when you want to do a big combination, say via velocity fields, you might have a vel uh, command field. But because of the way you can pass options into these command files, you could just simply have a single command file. And that's, these days, I must admit, the standard way we tend to do things. The output files, there is a print file, uh, which does not have any reference frame defined for it. And again, most of the time, people don't output this file because it doesn't really contain anything which is not going to be contained in the geolog file as you go through. And then the log file, again, is just a bookkeeping way of keeping, keeping track of what is happening during the run. There are also status and warning files that are generated similar to the way Gamut generates those. You can also look at those to see how your run is going. The APR coordinate files we typically have as .APR, and then the earthquake files .eq, and stabilization list sites, either .stab or sometimes it's .sab site. Again, it's flexible as to precisely how you do it. So Kalman filtering itself, it's just a good to keep in mind of how this estimation technique works. It is a sequential least squares estimation, but it allows for stochastic processes. And the generic that's used in Kalman filtering is a first order mouse Markov type process of which random walks are the simplest version of those. So the idea of Kalman filtering versus least squares, in least squares, you are dealing with a system typically in which the things you are trying to determine are fixed in time. And so you're trying to get your best estimate of those quantities. Kalman filters are designed for parameters that are varying in time, but not in simple parametric ways, in more complicated random fashions or process noise fashion. You can formulate a Kalman filter as a least squares problem if you wish to, just it tends to be a large estimation problem if you do that. And you certainly can set up scenarios where the Kalman filter and the least squares, if there is no process noise in the Kalman filter, will give you exactly the same answers as you go forward. So as I said, GlobeK allows random walks for coordinates, EOP, network translation scales, satellite parameters. And the thing about a random walk is that the variance of the process grows linearly with time, or the standard deviation versus the square root of time. Uh, for some of you with geodetic backgrounds. This is this process that leveling uh, invokes and leveling people always quote the uncertainty of square root of the distance that you've covered in the leveling. And that's because that model is a random walk model that's being used for representing leveling. Now if Kalman filters work in covariance matrices. And so that means you actually have to supply a priori covariance constraints for all of the parameters you're estimating. And unlike least squares, where you can have a completely unconstrained solution, Kalman filtering does not allow that. And if you want to read more about Kalman filtering, both as a generic geodetic estimation technique, there's the Herring et al. 1990 paper. And then for the quasi-observation combinations, there's a Dong et al. paper in 1998. The references are actually given in the footnotes of this slide in the PowerPoint presentation.
So there are some constructual confusions that we've noticed over the years with GLOBE-K, and it has to do with these two programs, GLOBE-K itself and GeoRed. And these two programs do exactly the same thing. In fact, GeoRed is actually a very, very tiny program which just simply reorganizes your GDL file and then calls GLOBE-K as you go through. So the idea of GLOBE-K, the way to think about it, is that it combines all of the H files that are given in the GDL file into a single solution. GeoRed takes each one of the H files or groupings of H files in the GDL file and generates a solution for each of the separate ones or that separate group of um, files that are there. So one of the optional things you can do in a GDL file is to put a plus sign at the end of the line. And when you do that, it interprets that the next file should also be included with the one just mentioned. And you keep going down with the plus signs and it will keep stacking those together until it hits a line which does not have a plus sign on the end of it anymore. And that marks the beginning of the next group. This again is the typical way we would combine multiple networks together on the same day, or if we're doing GNSS systems where we would combine all the GNS into a single solution as we go through. But when you've invoked GeoRed, it just simply creates a new GDL file specific for the case you were giving, and then runs GLOBE-K exactly the same as it would if you had run it um, by itself. Again, in these days, we would probably have actually made GeoRed a shell script rather than a program, but when it was written, shell scripts didn't really exist. So there's two types of solution files that come out of GLOBE-K, and again, uh, you just have to be a little careful of them. There is binary H files that get written out, and these are meant for saving and exchanging your results. These files we keep as backwards compatible. So in principle, a binary H file that was written back in 1990, we should still be able to read that file and use it in GLOBE-K today. Some of the bookkeeping won't be consistent with what we know these days, for example, about satellite information, et cetera. But fundamentally, the file should still be readable. There are also internal binary files that GLOBE-K uses. And the two big ones are the, what are called the COM file or the common file, and then SOL, which is the solution file. These are internal files, and these are the ones which potentially can conflict and overwrite each other if you're not careful when you're running parallel. And these files, we do change the formats of those with different versions, and they actually have version control on them. And so sometimes you will hit a potential error message if you're, say, running glorg, that the com file you are trying to run glorg with is no longer the valid version. Generally, we keep versions of glsave around because you can always take the com file and convert it into the the archival version of the H file with GL save, and then read that file back into GLOBE-K. So you just need to be a little careful of that as we switch versions. Most of the time, you don't keep these com files and sol files around for particularly long periods of time. So glorg uh, can be called directly in GLOBE-K or glred, or run separately. And you'd run it separately, typically on large velocity solutions where you may have run the solution in one reference frame, but then you want to change reference frames in the solution, change the list of stations you're using. You want to experiment with those sorts of ideas. In the same way that GLOBE-K is meant to make things faster when you have taken a large amount of data that might take many, many hours to process in gamut to do the phase processing or many days or weeks, GLOBE-K, if you're combining many years of data together, a large GLOBE-K solution can take 24 hours to run. And so the idea here with glorg is you end up with that file, that solution in a single file, which then can be manipulated to change the results or apply different constraints uh, in a very fast way, change coordinate systems. We talked earlier about having discontinuities in the data due to antenna changes. Generally, you want to be able to equate the velocities before and after those antenna changes. But certain cases, you'll have that the antenna may have failed and that you don't want to actually equate those velocities. And so Geolog lets you play around with seeing how those constraints actually work in a fast way. When you do want to do that, you have to specify the com file command in the globe-k command file as we go through. So the globe-k files, the ones that you have to supply, 
you have to supply the command files. And in fact, inside of the command file, there is a command called source, which lets you read other command files, at least for one level down. And we find that a very convenient way to be able to keep things uh, together as their separate files and be able to switch things easily if we want to. Again, we supply templates for these files, actually working templates that for many analyses you can just use directly as they are. Uh, and then typically you will take those and change them and manipulate them to do your own particular style of solution that you want to do. You have to just supply the GDL file, which is the list of the binary H files you want to process. You need to supply the binary H files themselves, which you either create from Sinex or from gamut H files. HDGlobal will also convert other file formats, but most of those other file formats have now fallen by the wayside from different analysis packages as uh, Sinex has taken over as the exchange format. Typically, you want to supply a priori coordinate files. Uh, these are optional, but we recommend that you think carefully about what your a priori's are. Again, if you're dealing with a global network of IGS stations, those APRs are all known, but typically you're dealing with your own network of stations. And so you'll have an APR file which has the coordinates of your stations in it, and that's the type of thing that you want to supply. There's earth orientation uh, files that you want to supply. Again, most people simply use the default, which is the uh, USNO Naval Observatory Bulletin A files that come from the IERS. Uh, we have shell scripts that update those on a regular basis, and uh, our tables get them updated every day. And so we are, again, it's optional, but we do recommend that you put those in just so you have good EOP, earth orientation parameters in your run. And finally, the earthquake file, or the EQ files, again, is optional, but it's also one of these where typically there is complexity in your data processing. There may be earthquakes, there's been equipment changes. Sometimes you actually, if it's survey data, you have the site on the wrong location, and you want to be able to change that name of that station to reflect that. And that's what's done in the earthquake files as you go through. This file also has to appear near the top of the command file, and we'll talk about that in a second. So the files which are generated by Globe-K, there is a file called .srt, which is actually the sorted list of your files, your H files that you are processing. So this binary list of H files does not have to be in time order. Um, it can be you know, all of the GPS ones, all the GLONASS files, and then all of the um, uh, Galileo files, and then the sort file will have them interspersed appropriately as they need to be to have them in time order. Uh, the com file is this com basically contains all the information about your solution, the types of things you're estimating. The sol file is the actual solution file with the full variance covariance matrix. This can be very large, uh, particularly if you're running a large back solution because each one of the covariance matrices has to be saved for each day of data. The SVS files, uh, the ephemeris files, and again, um, those get generated internally in Globe-K and you don't normally have to worry about them. So the output files that come out, there is an output that goes to the screen. You, uh, and actually most people just set the screen output not to go to the screen, in what we call the no print option. Um, there's a log file, which is short, essentially a few lines per uh, day that you're processing. The print file, again, is just the raw straight output of the solution. Generally, people don't um, bother printing that out because the information is contained in the org file. And you can output binary H files, which you can then use in other processing later on as you go forward. And there's a couple of subtleties in how to do this. And in the more interactive parts of this course, we may talk about the different ways that you can generate these H files as you go forward. So the important thing to also to keep in mind with the Globe K handling is the log files, print files, and org files. They're ASCII files that you can read with an editor or just look at with cat or with more or less. Um, and they get concatenated together. And so for something like GeoRed, where you're processing multiple days of data and you want to put the, all the results into an output file, that's exactly what you want to happen. You want the results to stack together as you put them out. But if you're generating a large velocity file, then the default in Globe-K would be if you run that solution twice, the second solution gets added to the end of the first solution. And that can be confusing. And so generally when we're doing things like velocity files, we either erase the org or the print file before we start, or there's an option in the output options which allows you to say erase, which tells it to erase the file 
before you go. And so that's sometimes one of those things that people get a tad confused about. So the consort and sol files are all overwritten every time you run uh, GlobeK, and uh, you should not rename those files, mainly because the names of the files are actually embedded inside of the files. And if you rename them, then it's not going to find them as you go across. Now, GlobeK has a series of automatic uh, naming schemes with wildcards uh, that allow you to have com files, all these binary files generated by GlobeK and the output files to have names which are generated typically based on the name of the GDL file that you are using. In the latest version of GlobeK, we also now have date and time designations, and that's very useful for um, setting up things where you want to have a random name for the GDL file, but you want the output to be referred to, say, a GPS week and a day of week, for example, or a year, month, and day type of output, even down to a time tag of a second if you wish to. And again, when you are running in parallel to make sure these com sort and sol files don't overwrite each other, then you want to make sure that you actually have unique names if you're running in the same directory. So the estimation command rules for GlobeK are another thing which uh, sometimes can be confusing when people start. So to estimate a parameter in GlobeK, as I said before, you give the AP or IPR and then whatever the type of parameter is to tell GlobeK what the uncertainty in the a priori value of that parameter is. The most common ones you would use is northeast up is for northeast up of the sites, and WOB is for polar motion, X and Y polar motion, UT1 is for UT1. There is an ATM, atmospheric zenith delay term. This is actually the average zenith delay for the day at a station. It's carried in through from the uh, binary, from the gamut H files. This does not appear in SINEX files. And so you can tell it to uh, put an a priori constraint or actually allow diff different H files which use the same station on the same day to have the atmospheric delay be linked between them as you go through. Now, an important thing is the binary H files come in with a set of parameters that are embedded in those files. What happens to those parameters depends on what you tell GlobeK to do. And specifically, if you do not tell GlobeK what to do with a parameter, it simply leaves it in its unconstrained state. And it essentially drops it out of the covariance matrix. Now, when you drop a rows and columns out of covariance matrices, that is essentially the equivalent of having that perimeter left free and unconstrained from that point on. In particular, if you ran orbits, relax mode in gamut, and then when you ran globe K, if you didn't tell it anything about orbits, those orbits would be left completely free. And so that in a short baseline mode would actually degrade your um, solution considerably, potentially. And so we do have to be careful sometimes that if you want to link parameters between different H files, that you actually do specify the APR uh, constraints, the APR uncertainties on them so that they get estimated. Now, if you give zero as an priori sigma, in GlobeK, this is interpreted as not to estimate the parameter. You may have noticed before when I gave the APR northeast up command, I said all and then 10, 10, 10 for 10 meters in position northeast and up, and then zeros for the velocity. By giving it zero, I'm telling it not to estimate the velocity. Now, of course, zero could also get interpreted as being you want zero a priori uncertainty on it, which is possible to do in a Kalman filter, but that's not the way we interpret it in GlobeK. If you want to force a parameter to its a priori value and to have zero variance, you actually have to use F for fix or force for the a priori sigma. And that is um, the convention that is used as we go through. And again, it has to just do with the way the commands get interpreted. So generally, you want to keep parameters loose in globe K when you're using glorg to rotate to determine the reference frame. Uh, and the reason is that the algorithm used in glorg assumes that you have a rank deficiency in the system and you're resolving that rank deficiency in the glorg solution as you go through. The important thing also, we often use these terms loose and tight in globe K. And this is something which you should probably explore at your leisure. Uh, to understand how this works. But when we say the term loose, what we really mean 
is that the a priori sigma is large compared to how well it can be determined without any constraints on it all. So if you can determine a position to a millimeter, for example, then one meter is actually quite a loose constraint on that because the ratio of that variance is 10 to the sixth. Um, and so you can actually afford to have quite large differences from the a priori, even though you have what appears to be a relatively tight constraint. Again, the reason this is important to keep in mind with common filters is that common filters are notoriously bad for numerical rounding errors and stability. And one of the main reasons that happens is when the a priori covariance matrix you start with has elements in it which are just too large because the common filter is going to start with those large elements and as you add data and new information, it's going to decrement those values down until you get to the final uncertainties at the end. And if you start them too large, you will definitely hit large numerical errors. So to do the earth orientation parameters, the um, standard way is with the APR WOB and UT1 command. So when you're doing global solutions, this is typically something like 10 milliarc seconds. So milliarc second at the surface of the earth is about 30, meter, 30 millimeters. So this is of order um, 300 millimeters on the surface of the earth. And again, since we are doing uh, millimeter level positioning, that 300 to one is a high ratio. So this is considered loose. And then the rate is milliarc seconds per day. So this is milli, um, uh, is 30 millimeters per day for the earth orientation. And again, that is loose compared to how well we can actually determine them. UT1, again, is in milliarc seconds, although the output gets converted to milli time seconds, which is the convention. When you're doing regional networks, if you're not using geolog, or if you're just using the position translation in geolog, you may want to constrain the rotation to, say, 0.5 milliarc seconds. These days we know wobble theoretically down more at about 50 microarc seconds. So these rotational terms here are sometimes not actually the orientation of the global frame, it's the orientation of your frame within the region which you are working. So most analyses we recommend actually you just stick to the loose version when you're using geolog because geolog will rotate you as it needs to be and over constraining the rotation in geolog can cause subtle errors as you go across. The only thing you have to worry about is that when you do orientation, you want to make sure your reference frame stations are surround the area that you're interested in so that the orientation gets interpolated inside of that mode as you go through. So data editing, or and really this is coordinate data editing, there's different ways you can do that. Uh, the big one we often do is to try to account for temporal correlation in the noise, which we do with the random walk process, and that's the ma northeast up command. Units are, milli, are meters squared per year. So the typical numbers we use are numbers like 10 to the minus six or 10 to the minus eight. So a typical Ma Northeast up command might be, you know, all again is all stations. And then this is the position in North, East and up and no velocity, random walk. Generally, we don't put um, process noise on the velocity terms because most of the time we think the velocities are, are constant with time. And then you can have individual stations where you actually make the values larger, for example. So one way, if you have a noisy station with a lot of correlated noise, then you want to you know, give that large process noise. We have a shell script called shgenstats that actually can be used to generate noise estimates um, and for the time series. And this works provided you have a reasonable number of um, points in your time series. This is, again, most appropriate when you have continuously running data in survey mode, what we tend to do is look at the continuous data near the survey sites and then apply those process noise models to the survey data on the assumption that the statistics are basically similar in that particular region. There are some very specific individual uh, points you can download. SIG Northeast Up just adds a white noise, just makes the sigma larger on a particular station. Um, that sometimes is useful if you are combining against survey with combined data and um, and you want to just downweight some of the data you know just a white noisy sort of fashion rather than with a correlated noise model which is what you're doing with the random walk process and you can do this for all stations you can do it for individual stations and you can also specify a time range if you wish to as you go across most of the arguments in here are optional 
And so globe K, if you don't give the time, it'll just assume it's everybody. You can also have specification of specific names in the H files that are needed. So this would apply every H file which had the string exactly in this form, emed05 embedded somewhere in its name, every station from those H files would have this sigma noise added to it. And you can uh, also, um, you know, so you can do a sigma northeast up to sort of make things worse. But in the EQ files, you can also do a rename of a site. And if you rename it to XCL, it will be completely excluded from your solution as well. And that's how we tend to edit sites out completely. In this case, in the sig northeast up case, the site remains, just has a large sigma added to it. So it would appear in a large error bar in your time series plots. When you do it with the EQ file in this form, the site just disappears completely and you don't see it anymore. So GLORG is used to apply constraints after the H files have been stacked. And again, when you stack them, you really want to typically keep the constraints loose on those stations as you go through. And again, it can be run as a separate program if you save the COM file and the SOL file. The SOL file automatically gets saved if you save the COM file. But you can specify its name again, which is worthwhile doing. This also allows you to link parameters together, as I said, with discontinuities. And you can also estimate things like Euler poles for plate motions, et cetera, as you go through. And so the parameters that are estimated in um, GeoLog should be kept loose in GLOBE-K. And in particular, that's the site coordinates, the EOPs, if you're estimating rotation in GeoLog, and scale, if you're estimating scale in GLOBE-K. We'll come back and talk about scale because it's quite subtle and has important consequences when you're processing. The thing about GLORG and the way we, the reason we do this for tectonic type analysis is that when we define the reference frame this way, if we don't estimate scale, which is our recommended process, then you don't introduce any strain into the network when you're resolving the reference frame. If you constrain individual stations and those station coordinates don't match what your data says they are, that will implicitly put strain in your network, which could lead you to you know, conclusions about your network, which are not particularly useful. So when you want to invoke GLORG from inside Globe K, then the standard way you do it is the org command, which you give it the name of the file, from GLORG command file name that is used. Uh, any of the command line options that you're using in Globe K get passed through into this use in this file as well. And then there's an org opt, which is the output options for, for GLORG. We'll talk about those in a second. You can also specify the output file name. We tend not to do that because it's much more preferable typically to have that name generated from the name of the print file that you give when you run GLOBE-K. And that's our recommended process. So the GLORG commands themselves, they have again many of them, but the main ones you have to worry about is the APR file. Again, if it's the same one as you used in GLOBE-K, you don't need to re-specify it, but it's very common to specify, for example, a plate-specific APR file uh, when you want to rotate into a particular reference frame for say the North American plate. And you can do that in the APR file in uh, GLORG, or you may have a system where you want zero around your area and you can just specify an a priori file which has zero velocity in it and it will align to that zero velocity field. Now the commands that control what you do to form the origin are the POSORG, which is the position origin and the rate origin commands. And then these take as arguments, X-tran, Y-tran, Z-tran, which is the translations in X, Y, and Z. Um, X what rotate, X, Y, and Z rot, which are the rotations, and again, scale. So there can be up to seven parameters that you specify there. And this allows you to rescale the system. We're gonna talk about that again later on when we talk in more detail about reference frames. But again, it's important if you do this in GeoLog is that you actually do it in GLOBE-K as well. We'll also put the note in here uh, that APR TRAN should probably be used in Gamut if you're running baseline mode. And again, uh, there is some issues. If you look carefully in the help of h to global you'll see that uh, when we convert baseline mode, we actually do allow translation automatically now. And it's an option for you to turn that off uh, which sometimes is useful if you're combining things together. Now, the strange sounding command is this condition in height command, 
And it's really how we height, how we weight the heights when we're doing the transformation of the reference frame. We saw briefly in the first lecture that height variations due to loading can be quite large. And so one of the techniques we use is in forming the reference frame is to downweight the heights relative to the horizontal components. So generally heights are always more poorly determined than the horizontal components. So normally something like a factor of 10 in variance is appropriate. If you want to reduce the weight of the heights considerably, you can give a value like a thousand, and this will stop the heights being used in forming the reference frame. Stab it is the number of iterations and sigma cutoff that you want to use for removing a site. And again, generally, we often go in a very large, a large list of reference frame stations, and then iterate the solution a number of times, five or six times, and then allow this algorithm to throw out those stations which aren't consistent with the ones that we were trying to estimate on that particular day as we go through. And again, in that iterative scheme, that's a, a reasonable way to have an automatic process going on. Uh, stab site is the list of sites that you want to use in the stabilization. And again, there is examples of this list in the, um, the gamut GG tables as we distribute them. So in terms of controlling the output of globe K, there's these sort of three character opt commands that specify specifically what you want to do. And then ER is, is a race. These are four character strings. These are separated by spaces. Uh, no PR is no print, uh, which we often use for the CRT option and the print option. BLN will print out the baseline lengths. Um, that's useful sometimes in the print file because the baseline lengths should be well determined even if no constraints are applied. BRAT is the baseline rates of change. Again, depending on your application, that's sometimes useful. It's important to remember that these can get very large outputs when you have large numbers of stations. There's an RNRP command that generates reports on renames. And in particular, if you're doing a forward globe K solution, it'll tell you what the change was in the position at a rename and calculate the uncertainty on that change based on the full variance covariance matrix. The fix a command is one which, if you have all your a priori coordinates correctly assigned, you shouldn't worry about but it's worthwhile to put it in uh, because what it assures is that the a priori values that you're using for your equates are the same a priori value in geolog. Because what gets equated in geolog is the adjustment to your a priori, not the actual value itself. Vsum and psum are summary outputs that allow you to output velocities. And this is needed if you're going to plot, use any of the shell scripts that plot velocities coming out of GloK. P sum is just sometimes a convenient way to do that. As well for the positions, it gives you the adjustment to the position. Um, GDLF lists the H files that you actually used and their chi squared increments for the runs. And then CMDS echoes the command file uh, as it exists when the output is generated. The only caveat you have here is if you run GLORG, you know, two months after it was originally run, uh, it will print the command file as it exists at the time it is run not necessarily as it was when it was run. So again, that basic program flow that we use is that we read all the high page file headers in. Then there's a set of commands that need to be given prior to reading all of these uh, H files so that we can actually form up the list of sites that are used, for example, and the list of satellite orbits, etc. So there is a group of commands that have to be at the top of the command file. Don't worry too much. If you put them out of order, GlobeK will tell you the command is out of order and simply stop. And then it's easy to go back and uh, uh, change the order, put it in the right place as you go forward. This first step is actually quite fast, even for large runs as you go through. Uh, it prints it, initializes the Kalman filter. Then it reads all the H files, sequentially estimating in your Kalman filter, computing the chi-squared increments as it goes. If it's too large for a particular experiment, it'll throw that day out and not use it. Um, it'll also check individual station coordinates to make sure that they match the a priori successfully. There's the option of running a back filter. Uh, the recent versions of GLOBE-K allow the reference frame to be realized during the back solution as well. And you can write binary hitch files out during the back solution if you wish to. Again, for doing orbit determination, this is a useful technique. If you're doing post-seismic, um, measurements after an earthquake, for example, with continuous data, and you want to have a smooth trajectory in the post-seismic signal, this is one of the techniques you could use to uh, smooth the um, post-seismic deformations going through. Or if you're looking at a hydrology signal, 
and you wanted to have a smooth representation coming out of globe K, this is one way you could do it. The alternative is to smooth the time series that you generate. And uh, I suppose each technique probably generates very fairly similar consistent results. It writes out the sole file and prints file, and then it invokes glorg, applying all those constraints that you've applied, linkages between parameters with the equate, constraint, and force commands, computes sky squared increments for each of those things, potentially estimates plate motions, and then writes out the org file as you go through. Now, there are some things that Globe K cannot do. It cannot repair cycle slips that were in the original analysis. If you use the wrong phase center model in the um, processing, it cannot fix that. If the eccentricity of the antenna is wrong, so you've got the height of instrument wrong, that can be fixed, but uh, nothing else can be fixed of that type. It can't resolve ambiguities because it would just make the files much too large. And it can't overcome nonlinear effects. So it's important to remember that all of the GPS processing is a linear operator and uh, linear least squares estimation. In gamut itself, we ensure that everything is good within 30 centimeters in the iterative solutions that you run when you do the prefit and the postfit runs in um, uh, gamut. And if it needs to, it'll iterate one more time to make sure that happens. Uh, Globe-K can delete um, stations, avoids contamination, although the impact of that station is sort of in the rest of the solution. But again, we do tend to find for most um, data these days that individual stations don't really corrupt the stations around them very much typically. And so deleting the station in the Globe-K level gives you a result which is quite similar to deleting uh, the station in the gamut level if it's a poor station. Again, something that's worth experimenting with if you want to play around with the subtleties of all of this. So again, in terms of those a priori coordinate files, um, in gamut, uh, we want the sites to be accurate to at least 10 meters for cycle slip repair. One of the things which we talk about in gamut that can happen is if your a priori coordinates are bad, uh, the cleaning program will throw out all your data even before you start. And as I said, you finally want the a priori coordinates to be good within 30 centimeters uh, when you finish, and that ensures linearity in the system. And for those sites that are being used to help restrain or determine the ambiguities, uh, it's good to have some sites which have accuracies at least of five centimeters. And again, for most continuous sites these days, that's not difficult to do. In Globe-K, when you invoke glorg, you want to make sure the a priori coordinates are accurate, millimeter accurate for the sites that are in your reference frame definition. Uh, again, you just, um, you are constraining the a priori coordinates when you estimate globe k, so they have to be reasonably close to the values as you go through. Uh, and then for complicated renames and deletes of data, it's sometimes worthwhile to make sure the a priori file contains all of the needed globe k names. Globe k will automatically generate coordinates, but if you do complicated things, it sometimes can get that wrong. And finally, there are extended entries that are allowed in the globe k APR files but not in the gamut ones. And that allows you to put in periodic terms and post seismic models as you go through. Uh, some of our shell scripts that we use when we do gamut processing will apply these extended terms so that the gamut a priori takes into account that, but gamut itself cannot read the extended entries. And then in geolog, the APR file only needs to be the coordinates of those reference frame stations and anything that you want to use in the equates to make sure that the a priori matches in the equates. Okay, so what's the types of things that can go wrong when you're doing gamma, uh, globe K, sorry. Uh, so a H file might not get used. Uh, it can be automatically deleted due to a high chi square. Um, that will tell you in the output. The most common reasons for high chi squares are when you have a station that is not where you think it is. It conflicts with some other H file that can happen in survey mode processing. So a coordinate adjustment that doesn't get caught with the um, a priori information. If you're combining with orbits, uh, you can get high chi squares because the orbit models are inconsistent between your processing and the one that you're using as the reference uh, H file as you go through. So again, a large high squ chi squares can be inconsistent data. Uh, and as I said, if you're running orbits in relaxed mode and you're using the MIT uh, large binary files, different modeling can make that very difficult. And we don't recommend that you do use those MIT GLX files just simply because it's so difficult to make sure your orbit model matches what we used when we generated them. Sometimes stations go missing because uh, of renames that have uh, renamed the site out of existence in some sense. 
Uh, you can use the program GeoList as a fast way. If GeoList, you can actually specify all of the APR files and all of the EQ files that you're using Globe K, and it will tell you the full list of sites that you actually have that Globe K will see. Uh, in GeoLog, the stabilization can fail. That can happen because you have too few sites. Um, again, we try to use as many as we can uh, for a robust solution. Typically, 20 or 30 uh, is not uncommon. When we do the NODA processing for North America, we use of order 500 stations for that. So, uh, and again, that robustness allows individual stations to be bad or uncertain on a given day and be automatically detected. When you have large uncertainties coming out of Geolog, it normally means you've got poor stabilization, or if you're doing sub-networks, that the sub-networks were not connected. And so if you do sub-network processing in baseline mode, read carefully the H2Global help on using the minus A option uh, when you convert those over to uh, binary H files. That's quite critical for sub-networks. Sometimes you have the opposite problem. Sometimes you end up with these uh, uncertainties are way too small. And that's, again, generally related to stabilization sites being too few. And particularly if you have rotation parameters and you have one station which is far away from everybody else, that station will dominate the rotation determination and will have a very small uncertainty in it. Uh, if you're equating parameters, you can have high chi-squared increments. And that could be that um, if it's a post-seismic deformation after an earthquake, for example, we certainly do see cases now where it appears that the secular velocity after an earthquake, because of changes in coupling on the fault, we believe, can be different. And so when you try to do an equate of the velocity before and after the earthquake, you may end up with inconsistent uh, values in large chi-squares, often putting in a post-seismic model will help with that. Um, and again, sometimes if you have the wrong velocities, uh, if it's unmatched in the a priori, that can cause problems. So a common way that we tend to use Globe K um, and GeoRed is in this iterative scheme. So the scenario here is that you have a regional area that you're interested in processing. When you process it, you include some of the IGS sites around you, maybe five to 10 of them as you, around your network. And then you generally run GeoRed first to, and use the standard IGS um, 2014 combined files and the list of uh, stabilization sites as you go through, and you can generate time series for all of your sites from that. You can then use TSSUM to extract the time series out of those, and then TSFIT to fit the time series, and SHGENSTATS to tell you the statistics of your time series and generate your process noise models. TSFIT can also generate new updated a priori coordinates as well based on the time series analysis. And then you might combine all of the data together using the process noise models that you've got from SHGenStat, and again, using the IGB14 a priori uh, model and coordinate list to come up with a set of velocities of all of your sites which are globally aligned to the IGS14 system. You can extract out the positions and velocities, SHGL extract, Globe K does that. That generates a new set of coordinates and velocities and now you have your stations in the frame of the global network in a consistent fashion. You can look at the stations in your regional network, which are behaving very well. And now you can modify the stabilization list to include your stations and maybe remove some of the global uh, IGS stations uh, if you don't need them. And then you can go back to step one, now using your own local reference frame sites generate your time series again, refine the estimates of the time series, the statistics of them all, and then keep updating the a priori and the stabilization list. And generally, you do that for a couple of iterations, and you have a good local representation of your, of your um, solution. So the associated programs that go with Globe K, we have H2Global, which we've talked about, which translates from gamut and other forms into binary H files. And then the inverse program is global to SINEX that generates SINEX from the binary H files. And this is what you would use if you wanted to distribute your uh, solutions in a way that other groups with other analysis programs could use them. GeoList gives you the list of the contents of your H files. And certainly with gamut H files tells you information about the models used, et cetera, as you go there. HF update allows you to update the binary H files for changes in station.info or SINEX header information. Really here, the only thing you can correct is the eccentricity. So if you use the wrong antenna height, for example, 
that can be corrected in HF update. Um, generally, we use HF update to look for inconsistencies in metadata rather than trying to actually update um, binary hitch files with it these days. TSSUM, TSFIT, and TSCON are time series analyses programs that run in batch. We'll talk more about them later on in this course. And then there are some MATLAB interactive programs, VELVIEW and TSVIEW, that allow you to interactively view velocities and time series that are generated by GlobeK. So, summary, the GlobeK has lots of features. And one of the important things to remember is that due to its evolution with time, it's been around since about 1983 at this point. Um, there are multiple ways of doing the same thing or similar things. And so you want to think a little about how you best want to attack something. Uh, and you consider doing it multiple ways to see whether you actually get the same answer when you try that. There is extensive help. The help files typically will tell you initially how to run the program, the basic command line structure that you need. And then there will be information about the recent updates that have been made. And then further down in the help files is the more detailed information about how to run programs, et cetera, the commands that are available in those programs. So GlobeK itself is typically where you make a lot of complex analysis decisions. And therefore, it can be quite daunting for people when they start, because you start with sort of a blank sheet. So in the gamut side, we can do things in a very batch-oriented way because we generate a very loose product from that, which has no real decisions made necessarily. GlobeK is where you're going to now start working on the science problem that you're trying to solve and doing your analysis in a way that best represents the problems you're trying to solve. So experimentation and testing your ideas how different options work, that's the best way to learn the software. And just to give you some examples of things you might consider is what happens to your velocity and position estimates if you turn on the APR TRAN command, which is the translation command. How does that change things when you do it? How do your estimates change if you change the values that you actually use in APR northeast up? You'll see we typically run these as very loose values. Um, but if you make them too loose, you're going to have numerical stability problems. If you make them too tight, they're going to uh, corrupt the way GLORB works, for example. Where is that balance for the solutions that you're doing? What happens to your sigmas and your estimates when you increase the Markov process noise? This becomes a random walk. One of the things about random walks typically is that as you make the values larger, what effectively happens is you weight the data at the beginnings and your ends of the time series more heavily. And you can sort of see that in the way the velocities evolve with time. You can edit stations out. You can do it at the gamut level. And then compare to what happens if you edit them out at globe K. So many, many things to do. And my take home message at this point is experimentation is the best way to learn of all of these different options that you may want to consider. So thank you.